we are now at the last section of this uh, chapter 16. Uh, it is now the sacrificial faith from verse 21 to verse 28. Verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. So from that revelation at the uh, Caesarea Philippi, revelation unto Peter and the disciples as well, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so from that time, Jesus' ministry ended in Galilee. And he was to make a new turn and head south and go towards Jerusalem and then the cross. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. And you see, this is the first prediction. The prediction is that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. So, number one, he has to go to Jerusalem. Number two, he must suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes. And number three, and be killed. And number four, and be raised the third day. And this is the first prediction. There are two more predictions of the same message. And that you will find in Matthew chapter 17, verse 22. Matthew chapter 17, verse 22. Now while they were in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is, to, is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. And they will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised again. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And we have another prediction by Jesus, and you find this in Matthew 20, verse 19. Matthew 20, verse, let me read from verse 17. Now Jesus going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up. I'm sure you know by now, regardless of direction, whether they're going north, south, east or west, when they are approaching Jerusalem from whichever direction, they are always going up because it's on elevated ground. So, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify and the third day he will rise again. I mean, Jesus was repeating this to emphasize that this is how it will be. But sadly, the disciples did not really internalize this. They did not receive this. They did not comprehend this until the last. So, verse 22. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, rebuke Jesus, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. And what you have just seen is that Peter at his worst. Earlier on, in verse 15, in verse 16 rather, in, in answering uh, the question Jesus posed to them, he's, he was at his best. He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But now, when Jesus said that he must go because he came in obedience unto the Father, even death at Calvary. He must go forth. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He just could not comprehend. He cannot reconcile that this is the Messiah. This is God. Uh, he is the Christ. He should not be treated this way. And see, not only Peter, but Jews until today, 
those Orthodox Jews until today, they still believe and look forward to the Messiah in Psalms chapter 2. The Messiah in Psalms chapter 2 is the political Messiah where he'll be ruling and reigning. And he, he's, just, he's just the political victorious king of Israel. And that's what they like. That's what they want. But they cannot accept the concept of a suffering Messiah, a suffering Savior. Because if you see that, if you read that, and I'm sure the, the Pharisees and Sadducees and Jews would know in Isaiah 53, that was the suffering Savior because he was stricken, he was beaten, and, and, and he was just humiliated and punished physically. And that, they could not, they could not accept that. And also in Psalm 22, where the shepherd was suffering. Again, it is prophetic in Psalm 22 of a suffering Savior. And the Jews could not accept that. And so Peter, with that, with that mindset, he just could not accept this when he heard this from Jesus in verse 21. So verse 22, Peter 2 Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Now, this is totally out of order. Because even in the Jewish culture, there is this uh, master and discipleship relationship where the disciple is to honor the master and have full respect for the master. It is unthinkable for the disciple to rebuke the master. But here we see the fallibility of Peter. We see the frailty of Peter. That you know he engages his mouth before he engages his mind. And so he said, Far be it from you, it shall not be. And he said, Lord, this shall not happen to you. You know, if there is a word for this, it is called oxymoron. Because here, he calls Jesus Lord. Lord. That, is, that, that gives the, the picture of one who has authority, one who, is, who has sovereignty. I mean, in the context we are studying, and, and for Peter to have gone with him for the last two over years and, and to even profess that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. This Lord means the Lordship of this God over Peter. He called him Lord and yet he could not believe that Jesus is still in control of the situation. And even as Jesus has spoken the word in verse 22, 21, I mean, is it not true? Is it something that Peter cannot accept and he will reject the word of God? And that's essentially what he did by saying, far be it from you, he was rejecting the word of God. And yet he called him Lord. So it is really contradicting. But Jesus, but he turned and said, to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. It is not that Peter was Satan, but just that he was a tool of the Satan, of Satan. He was used by Satan. He was deceived by Satan. But Peter's counsel was well-meaning. Who would want someone that he knows, especially someone that he reveres, someone that he, uh, he honors and respects? He wouldn't want that someone to suffer. So it was a well-meaning advice to, to Jesus. You know, this shouldn't happen to you. But you know, in life, uh, in our walk with Christ, Sometimes well-meaning counsel does not equate with godly counsel. 
well-meaning advice may not be godly advice. So Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Wow, if you were Peter, you will faint. Why? Why did Jesus say this to me? I meant well. And Jesus went on, You are an offense to me. If you read in your center margin, it means a stumbling block. Earlier, earlier, Jesus said, You are Peter, the small rock. You are the Petros. But now you are a stumbling block to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God. You are not focused on the cross. You are not focused on the things of God. That Jesus must die. And he has sat at the feet of Jesus for the last two over years, seen the miracles, heard the teachings. And still he did not comprehend this. He did not receive this. He did not perceive this. So, let's not be hard on him because many of us, we, have, we could have sat in church, listened to Bible teachings and attended classes and so on. We may not be enlightened. So, that was Peter. And Jesus concluded this part by saying, but the things of men. You're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So you acted out of human nature, Peter. You were apart from divine revelation. So earlier on, in verse 16, you had divine revelation. And so you could say that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But now you are acting Apart from divine revelation, it, it was not divine revelation unto you. You were acting out of your own human nature, so you defended, you tried to defend or prevent Jesus from this. Well, it happens to the best of us sometimes. But praise be to God, Peter repented and he had the revelation eventually because when you read First Peter, that means later on in his life, in his ministry, after Jesus had returned to the Father and he went on serving, ministering in the church. And he wrote First Peter chapter 2, verse 24 for us. And that shows a Peter who has gotten the revelation finally. Because in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, let me read from let me read from verse 23. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. Referring to Jesus. Peter wrote about Jesus. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself, referring to Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So by the time Peter wrote this, epistle he has got the revelation and now he is propagating the gospel that jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree and he died to sin so 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 we having died to sin must might live for righteousness it is so far different than when he first said to jesus Get the uh, 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 far, the, far be it from you that this should take place, that this should happen to you. Because then he did not accept the sacrifice that Jesus was going to go through. But now in First Peter, he is reporting it and he has accepted it. So, God allows you turn second chances. So now we come to verse 24. 
Now, verse 24, um, last year I preached at uh, church, Bethesda, uh, one of the Sundays, and it was loss is gain. So the, one of the paradoxes that the elders of the church uh, did uh, over a month. So I did this on that Sunday. So if you want more details, more illustrations, uh, please uh, get the recording from the church. Or if you wish, let me know. I can send you the link. So verse 24, Then Jesus said, to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So let's pause here and go back to verse 24. If anyone desires to come, the first word, the first word, if, so is, I mean, um, you, you have to make the decision. It is not like everyone, yeah, it is if you so desire, if you so choose. And the second word there is anyone. So it is an individual decision. It is not by group entry. It is not by group decision. So if anyone so it is personal one must make that decision and you must make that decision to go to him because he has already come all the way from heaven to you all we need to do now is to go to him if anyone desires is a personal decision to come after me that means to be to follow him to be his follower then let him deny himself. Let him deny himself. Now, simply put, to deny yourself, that means saying no to yourself and yes to Jesus. That's what it means. To deny yourself. Say no to yourself. Say no to your wishes, your desires, your, your whatever. But saying yes to Jesus. That's what it is. So if I can show you John chapter 8, verse 50. John chapter 8, verse 50. What did Jesus say? And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. I do not seek, even Jesus himself said, I do not seek his, uh, my own glory. He does not seek his own glory, but to the one who seeks and judges. But it is for God and for God's sake. He wasn't doing it for his own glory. And so likewise, we must follow his example and not do anything for our own glory. So denying yourself. One more, Philippians chapter 2. Verse 25. Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. You just see what Paul wrote in Philippians. Uh, Yet I consider it necessary to send to you Ephaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you have heard he was sick, for indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I send him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in great in esteem. Because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his own life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. So what Paul was saying in such a lengthy passage here, in these few verses, you know, there's this brother, Epaphroditus, he did not regard his own life, 
but he sacrificially attended to me, which you, Philippians, could not. But he did. Even he, he came close to death. He was still denying himself so that he could attend to me, to my needs. So that was an example of denying yourself. So if anyone desires to come after Jesus, number one, he must deny himself. Number two, take up his cross. Take up his cross. You know, if you were back in the days of Jesus, when you are sentenced to crucifixion, when you pick up the cross, it means the end. The end. You are on the march to death. Because once you get to your spot and they plant the, and they, 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 they nail into your hands and they nail into your feet and then they prop you up in the ground, that's the end. So when you pick up the cross, you have nothing left to look forward to on this earth. You've got no more worldly ambitions. That's what it means. So when you take up the cross, it is that which points to death. And you've got no more earthly ambition. So what is the application for us? Well, of course, I know th today we have people uh, picking up the cross daily. They hang it around their neck. Now that is cosmetic. That is cosmetic. That is not sacrifice. So this is a different cross. So taking up the cross, that means dying to worldly ambitions. Maybe you want to climb the corporate ladder, you want to sail the world, you want to win your Olympic goal, you want whatever. But you have decided, no. Christ first, the rest can wait. So you are giving up your worldly ambitions. You are picking up your cross. Take up your cross and pick up your own cross. Take up his cross, not someone else's cross, but your own cross. So, number one, if you want to follow Jesus, deny yourself. Number two, take up your cross. What is it you are willing to give up for Christ's sake to serve him? Number three, follow him. Follow me. And Jesus said, Take up his cross and follow me. Not man, not follow another preacher, follow another evangelist, follow another prophet, follow another pastor. No, follow Jesus. Not even to follow a church, but to follow Jesus. We look at 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Peter wrote, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin nor was deceit found in his mouth. So, in short, what was Peter saying? Peter was saying all that Jesus did, even in his suffering, he was setting an example for us. So that we should likewise follow his steps. That's what Peter wrote. We read on for verse, uh, verse 25. For whoever, whoever desires to save his life, this is referring to the physical life. Whoever desires to save his life, his physical life, will lose it, lose his life. Which life is this? Spiritual life. Some people want to have the very best of living comfort for themselves, all the wealth and riches in, for their physical life. But they forsook the better things, which is spiritual in nature. And they will lose that for all eternity. They will lose that life, lose it spiritually. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If you surrender your life to our Lord Jesus, 
you surrender all your physical, your earthly desires, you, you die to self, you will find it, you will find eternal life, which is spiritual. And eternal life is not, is not, does not commence from the day you pass away, but it commences from the day you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So whoever loses his physical life, for his sake, for his sake, I mean, whatever you did, you did unto the Lord. And, and there have been many, many martyrs in the church history. And if, if you remember, some time back, I showed you, I showed you a list, a list of these disciples who suffered for Christ. And here you look in this slide, you look uh, in the center, all these disciples, James the Greater was stabbed with a sword, uh, another was filled with sword, crucified by soldiers, uh, crucified on an axe, crucified in Judea, and so on and so forth. They accept John, the Apostle John. They all died a painful, terrible death. But it's okay. Well, it's okay. Because whoever loses, whoever loses his... Uh, let me read this again. Whoever loses his life for Jesus' sake will find it. And that is verse 25. Verse 26, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? It is a very lousy exchange. You gain the whole world, wealth, power, fame, fortune, but you lose your own soul, which is the most precious commodity if I may use the word commodity, but it's most invaluable because Jesus paid the highest price of himself to purchase you. And that is so precious. But if you prefer the world and you lose your soul, it is a lousy, terrible, poor exchange. Or what will man... And or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each to his own works. So Jesus now, in, in, in this delivery, he now points, not from now, because now he's talking about loss is gain. If you... Gain now, you lose the future. If you lose now, you gain the future. In short, that's what he's saying. And who will come and distribute the rewards? And when will this happen? When the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And all this will happen at the end of the tribulation. After the seven-year tribulation and at the beginning of the millennium. This is what will happen. And then he will reward each. Again, you know each. First, you've got to make your own decision for him or not for him. And then he will reward each to his own works. So if you are a believer, your, your judgment has been uh, paid for uh, in the person of Jesus Christ. And now, it is only for rewards, for your works, what you have done for Him. We will cover more of this when we look in the subsequent books. Verse 28, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. So, now earlier on, we see, the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels and to give away rewards. That is the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is the second coming after the tribulation. 
But now in verse 28, and some people have misinterpreted this, misunderstood this, because in verse 28, Jesus said, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So they thought, wow, either the kingdom is coming very soon so that some of them can see Jesus coming in his kingdom or some of them are going to live very, very long time until sometime in future when some of us will see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Some of them standing with Jesus. But Jesus wasn't referring to the second coming. Jesus, in effect, did appear to them. And we will study that next week in chapter 17. That is the transfiguration of Jesus on the high mountain together with Moses and Elijah, the transfiguration. And there were Peter, James and John who were with Jesus and they witnessed the transfiguration. And that's what Jesus was referring to. In verse 28, Assuredly I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So our last verse is this in 2 Peter. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 15. And this is what Peter wrote. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you Always have a reminder of these things after my decease. So Peter penned this down, this word of God down for our benefit that we be reminded and others who read this uh, epistle of his that you will always have a reminder of these things after my decease. And he said in verse 16, For we did not, he and his fellow disciples, did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were witnesses of His majesty. That means we saw His majesty. For we received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to Him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So what Peter was writing in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 to 18 is a witness account of the transfiguration. Not of him only, but he with two others, Peter, James and John. Three of them. And they saw this and they heard the voice of God saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And they heard all this on the holy mountain. And that is exactly what Jesus said in verse 28, the last verse of Matthew 16. So we will stop here and then we will resume uh, next week with chapter 17. So this last section here, is the sacrificial faith. So Father, we thank you once again for the faith that you have given to us. We are not like the Pharisees and Sadducees who got no faith. We have. And I pray that the faith will not remain little as when the disciples were earlier on in their walk with Christ. But we thank you, Lord, for the saving faith that we now have. And may it be sacrificial as well, that as we continue this sojourn on earth, that it will be the world behind us and the cross before us, even as we make our way towards Him day by day. Help us, Lord, as we 
journey on. In Jesus' name, amen.